world justice. Unit 731 worked overtime throughout the Second World War to provide horrific biological and chemical weapons for the embattled Japanese Empire. Ishii and his scientific team soon determined that the thousands of rats kept at the facility could be used as living flea factories. All that was needed were field experiments to determine the best way to spread disease. And to help Ishii accomplish his first and foremost goal, the creation of deadly and easily deliverable bubonic plague bacteria. Bubonic plague is a horrible disease that causes a high fever, vomiting of blood, shivering, body pains, and respiratory failure that results in a dark purple body color. Three out of four people who contract this disease die. But even those odds of survival were too high for Shiro Ishii. In order to develop the perfect plague, Ishii decided to turn his attention to the surrounding countryside. But Ishii had one large problem. Although he had the perfect bacteria and the perfect carrier, he had to find the perfect delivery system. First, he tried spraying fleas from airplanes. Shoichi Matsumoto was a pilot attached to the unit. Under the wings, there was a space to attach bombs. Instead of bombs, a basket or something like that was attached. It was almost a meter long and opened on each side and was filled with deadly fleas. Tests began immediately, and the targets were Chinese villages unlucky enough to be within range. There was no other reason for their selection and no mercy for their inhabitants. In early 1939, mysterious killer plagues began to break out in villages and continued to do so until 1942. My village is in the southern part of the county and uh, plague suddenly broke out in, in late summer 1942, suddenly broke out and one third of the villagers died. Eight people in my grandfather's family died of plague. Other delivery systems were tried, including poisoning the local water supplies on which the Chinese depended. No matter how these plagues were introduced, the results were devastating to those unlucky enough to be contaminated. Between 1941 and early November and 1942, there was an outbreak of the plague. The first person infected with the plague was a neighbor, and then it was the families around. Within 10 days, 13 villagers died of the plague. In 1942, my grandfather, within a short time, could not get up from his bed and died. After him, it was my grandmother, who also was sick and died within a day or two. The symptoms and toxicity were precisely what Ishii was looking for. People died. Nobody dared to bury them or carry them. They had to be cremated. My sister's gland was swelling up on her neck. Her neck was so swollen that it was as thick as her head. So, without any of her loved ones by her side, she went into the field and died by herself. Not content just to spread plague, Ishii's men even sunk so low as to hand out candy to starving Chinese children. Chocolates that were laced with anthrax a highly lethal disease that attacks the respiratory and digestive system. Conducting these horrific tests was dangerous work, and on occasion the Japanese themselves became victims. Over the years, 1,600 Japanese researchers and soldiers died as a result of mishandling the various bacteria and viruses. Ishii knew that his delivery systems were too imprecise, then he had an inspiration. He decided to deliver unconventional payloads with modified conventional weapons, ceramic bombs loaded with plague-infested fleas. 
the bombs could be aimed, and not only would the fleas survive the drop, all traces of the ceramic shell would disintegrate into the soil. Target villages were selected. The infectious bombings were carried out. But in their relentless quest for perfection, the Japanese decided they needed to examine their victims on the front lines. The Japanese came to the village in white uniforms, with high boots, rubber boots, and with masks. As in the labs at Unit 731, immediate examination of the damage being done by the pathogens was of the greatest value. They just uh, divided the peasants into two groups. They pulled them into the fields and opened their belly when they were still alive. These open-air dissections and other equally grim tests were conducted for a reason, to perfect a weapon that could be deployed against Japan's enemies. And the number one enemy was the United States. Thanks to Shiro Ishii, Japan now had a way to strike back. And as the Ring of Steel closed in on Japan, Plans were underway to deliver these unspeakable weapons to American soil using an ingenious yet dangerously simple method. Given the opportunity, the Japanese military would not have hesitated to use both biological and chemical weapons against the United States. The objective, of course, was victory. And any method that would achieve victory was uh, within the ballgame. War II in the Pacific was as ugly and racist a war as has ever been fought. And to the Japanese, the United States was the main enemy. After Pearl Harbor, they looked for many ways to attack the U.S. mainland. And in order to achieve this goal, they were prepared to stop at nothing. Even, some believe, experimentation on Allied prisoners of war. Among the first prisoners taken by Japanese in the early years of the war were the self-proclaimed battling bastards of Bataan. These men, taken prisoner in the Philippines in the spring of 1942, not only survived the infamous death march, but they also survived transshipment from the Philippines to Japan and China, just ahead of MacArthur's dramatic return. Some of these men, at this point reduced to skin and bones by years of malnutrition, ended up in a POW camp in the city of Mudken, located 500 miles south of Harbin, China. It was there in the fall of 1944 that the normal program of brutality took a strange turn. The POWs began to receive visits from Japanese doctors. Surprising because this was the first medical attention of any sort that they had received in over three years of captivity. Well, the interesting thing is that none of the guys knew anything about 731. Well, all we knew is that we were getting all kinds of shots and things like that, but they were telling us at the time that this is just to, to for your health. They didn't have any idea that it was experimentation. I think they gave me Amtrak. I think they gave me scarlet fever. Some believe that their fellow prisoners were actually taken directly to Unit 731 for more personal and fatal attention. I know they took probably at least one or two of our guys up there because we never heard about them again. When Mud Ken was finally liberated in September of 1945, the newly released prisoners were debriefed, but the records of their testimonies were officially sealed. More than 50 years later, their stories have still not been verified by the U.S. government. And toward the end of the war, the terrible weapons created by Unit 731 came very close to being used on the United States mainland. <laughs> 